Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. And as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to the 41st edition of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of January 26th to February 1st, 2012. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be, you know, while you're renter and raconteur, I'll be talking about things important to me that I think deserve your attention. Uh, if you have any reactions to the show, you can contact me directly. My email address is hoviating at AOL.com. That's W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, uh, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here somewhere during the show a couple of times. Uh, and uh, you can um, get the web address, uh, the email address rather from there. If you do write me, I only have one request that in the subject line you say something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something so that I know it's not spam. All right, I got several things to get through today, so uh, not a lot of time on each one, but do as many of them as I can. Uh, the, uh, the first thing, I love this. I can start with good news. I actually have three bits of good news to start this week with. First is that... Uh, SOPA and PIPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act and the Protect IP Act, well, they haven't been killed, but they have been knocked unconscious. Uh, these are bills I've talked about before. Their supposed purpose is to combat piracy on the internet, but um, they do it in such a draconian and corporate-friendly way that the result could be that large swaths of the internet would go dark. Uh, as the result of protests and opposition by the online public and significantly by the tech industry, uh, the bills, well, the, the votes that have been scheduled in the House and Senate on these bills uh, has been indefinitely delayed. Now, of course, that means the bills aren't dead. They're just unconscious for now. But you've got to remember that the entertainment industry sees the Internet as just as another means of dispensing their wares, another, another means by which they will supply the content and we will pay them for it. So do not think this is over. Do not think they're not going to come back. Uh, but the thing is, in keeping alert on this, something you also need to know, you cannot depend on the corporate media. You can't. Uh, media Matters for America did a study of network news coverage of these bills. Uh, between October 26th, when they were introduced, and January 12th, which is when the survey ended, they checked out the evening news coverage, the, the evening newscast of MSNBC, Fox, ABC, CBS, NBC, and CNN. And there were a total of two stories about SOPA and PIPA. And I don't mean two each, or an average of two, I mean two, period. And they were both on CNN. All those other networks did not mention it once during their primetime newscasts. Not once. So the point is, if you want to stay informed on this, you have to go to alternative media. You cannot depend on the corporate media. All right, the second bit of good news starts with a quote. This is a quote. I have always believed in traditional marriage between a man and a woman. That's what I believe to this day. But this issue isn't about just what I believe. It's about respecting others, including people who may believe differently than I do. It's about whether everyone has the same opportunities for love and companionship and family and security that I have enjoyed. With those words, Washington State Senator Mary Margaret Haugen announced that she was going to vote in favor of a bill uh, legalizing, recognizing same-sex marriage in the state of Washington. With her support, that bill now has majority support in the state legislature, and it will pass. And since Governor Chris Gregoire was the one who proposed the measure, well, she's going to sign it, which means very soon Washington will join with New York, Connecticut, Iowa, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, and the District of Columbia, where the legal ability to form a legally recognized family will no longer depend on the gender of the person you love. Beyond this, New Jersey legislature appears ready to pass a same-sex marriage bill. Uh, New Jersey already has um, civil unions, but this would actually generate full equality. Uh, as a sort of, though, PS to be filed under no good news goes unsullied, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie has said that he's going to veto the bill. And it doesn't look to me like there are enough votes to override it. But then again, the last time this came up in the state, uh, it didn't get out of the legislature. 
didn't pass. So things are moving in the right direction, especially considering that a survey in December found that a majority of the residents of New Jersey favor recognizing same-sex marriages. All right, and this is the third good news, and I saved this one for last because this is the one that really surprised me. On Monday, January 23rd, the Supreme Court ruled that police violated the Constitution when they placed a GPS tracking device on a suspect's vehicle without a valid search warrant. Now that this court, which has repeatedly found in favor of expanding police powers, which has repeatedly been found grinding down privacy protections, which has previously been found eviscerating the Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable searches and seizures, that this court reached that conclusion was really surprising. What really blew me away, the decision was unanimous. The only difference among the justices was how sweeping the decision should be. Uh, five of the justices, in an opinion written by Antonin Scalia, uh, said that putting the tracker on the car was every bit as much a search of the suspect's property as going into his house would have been. So it, clearly, uh, a warrant was required. The other four, in an opinion written by, here's another surprise, Sam Alito, would have gone beyond that to say, in addition, that tracking the car for a month, which is what the cops did, violated the suspect's uh, reasonable expectation of privacy. The five just argued that you didn't have to go that far because you'd already found it was unconstitutional, so leave it there. The thing is, one of those five, Sonia Sotomayor, said that while she was joining with um, Scalia's opinion, she agreed with Alito's reasoning, which means that if a case comes up where uh, the reasonable expectation of privacy really is at issue, she could be counted on being part of that five-vote majority. Which means right now, today, there are five, a majority of Supreme Court justices who are ready to find that almost any long-term high-tech monitoring of a suspect without a, uh, without a search warrant could violate that person's reasonable expectation of privacy. Now, the government argued that uh, putting a tracking device in a car, they say the FBI does this thousands of times a year, they said, uh, that this is such a minor violation of property rights, and it doesn't matter, it's not what we're talking about. Um, and, uh, and plus, anybody walking down a, uh, going down a public street can't think that they could go unmonitored, so we could do this anytime we want for any reason or for no reason. The thing is, during oral arguments, uh, and personally, I really think this had a lot to do with the outcome of this case. During oral arguments, the government had to admit that by its own logic, the cars of the justices themselves could be tracked indefinitely without a warrant. The justices were described as disturbed by this. And damn straight, I bet they were, because, oh, now it affects you. So now suddenly privacy is important. Walter Dellinger is a former Solicitor General who acted as counsel for the defendant in the case. He called the decision a signal event in Fourth Amendment history, and um, it may be, it may well be, it might turn out, it might mean that this was the day when the members of the Supreme Court came to the realization that GPS devices, cell phone tracking, facial recognition technology, surveillance cameras, computer data mining, and all the other high-tech tricks of the surveillance state are not the same as a cop on the beat or a cop at a stakeout. And if they do realize that, that would be a very, very good thing. All right, we're moving on there to uh, the outrage of the week. The outrage of the week. Uh, Barack Obama, or President Hopi Changi as I like to call him, he came into office promising the most transparent administration in history. Instead, that same administration has set a record for prosecuting whistleblowers. The latest victim in this war on information is a former CIA officer named John Kiriakou. He was indicted on Monday on charges of espionage for allegedly releasing classified information to journalists and others about mistreatment of prisoners at Gitmo and about the torture of other suspected terrorists. If convicted, he could face several decades in prison. 
He is the sixth government official to be indicted by the Obama administration on a charge of leaking information to journalists and charged under the Espionage Act. That is twice as many as all previous presidents combined. And the law dates back to 1917. Now, the defense said it may argue that these charges, in effect, criminalize what has long been normal interaction between uh, uh, government people and the press. And in essence, it is. The difference here is that these leaks were unapproved rather than the approved leaks that every administration deals in in order to advance its own interests. Now, there were two things that add weight to the contention that this is actually not about protecting national security, but instead about controlling what the, what the public is able to know. One is that no charges were filed against anybody who received the information. Uh, th that information went not only to journalists, but also to lawyers for detainees at Gitmo and to investigators for the American Civil Liberties Union. The other thing, uh, Jessalyn Raddick, uh, she is the National Security and Human Rights Director for the Government Accountability Project. Uh, she noted that what's been missing from all of these charges has been any claim that any of these people actually harmed the United States, or even that they intended to. I mean, put another way, why would you use the Espionage Act against people who are not spying? if it's not for the purpose of terrorizing other potential whistleblowers into keeping their mouths shut. But Anthony Romero, he's the executive director of the ACLU. He's the one that really nailed it. He noted how the government continues to investigate and to prosecute people who help the rest of us know about who committed torture, while that same administration has not taken a single solitary step toward prosecuting anybody who actually committed torture. And if that is not a legal and moral outrage, I can't imagine what would be. It is, in fact, the outrage of the week. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to be back in 10 or 15 seconds. And we're back, which is silly because you can see that we're back. Uh, something I haven't talked about in a while is global warming, uh, but something about it that came up just, uh, just recently. On January 19th, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, this is the agency of NASA that deals with uh, global warming and so on. Uh, but uh, the Institute announced that global average surface temperature for 2011, this is worldwide, was the ninth warmest year on record the records dating back to 1880. Uh, this continues a trend that has seen nine of the 10 warmest years on record have occurred after 2000. It's also another in a string of such reports from NASA, from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the United Kingdom's Met Office, which is their version of the National Weather Service, and the Climatic Research Unit at the University of East Anglia in Great Britain. It also gives me a chance to talk about the, if I can stretch the word far enough, thought processes of the naysayers on global warming. So the thing is, uh, in the face of facts like those I just laid out, the, the nanny nanny naysayers were declared that, oh, it doesn't matter, it's not important. This is just, these are just more claims by elite scientists looking to ride the global warming gravy train. All right, well, maybe they'd be a little more impressed with a publication last November of uh, World Energy Outlook 2011 by the International Energy Agency. Now, the IEA is no environmental darling. It's an intergovernmental agency that has been accused of downplaying the potential for renewable energies, of soft-pedaling peak oil, of uh, being overly optimistic about fossil fuel supplies, and playing politics with energy policy. But even now, it said in that report that if we don't take action to curb global warming within the next five years, it'll be too late. Alarmism, the naysayers will say. Chicken little stuff. All right. 
Well, what about the fact that China, remember China now has been accused of deliberately sabotaging international agreements on global warming in order to protect its own industrial growth. But just uh, last week, a report out of the Chinese government said that uh, global warming will cause China to have severe food shortages, severe shortages of drinking water, severe weather events, and increasing temperatures, including up to a 20% reduction in grain production all by 2050. And that as a result of this, China is taking stricter measures to at least try to control the growth, if nothing else, of its uh, production of greenhouse gases. Well, none of that matters, you'll be told, none of it. Uh, the books have been cooked, the data has been manipulated, contrary data has been hidden, the temperature, record, uh, temperature stations are all messed up, uh, the math is wrong, the whole enterprise is, is, is unreliable and shoddy where it's not crooked, it's a conspiracy, it's a hoax. So those sorts of folks, you got to understand, were really delighted a while back when a group of mostly physicists at UCAL Berkeley in California declared they were going to do their own analysis of the temperature data. The Berkeley Earth Project, it was called. And it was based on the conviction that the temperature calculations to date had not used a wide enough range of data, uh, had not paid enough attention to the critiques of the naysayers, and these people, being physicists, were convinced that only they could be trusted to get the math right. More seriously, in the words of the group's leader, uh, Professor Richard Muller, there was a deep concern that discordant data had been concealed by agencies reporting on climate change. In other words, they said they suspected that outfits like NASA, NOAA, the Met, and the CRU were all lying. They were going to use their own methodology. They were going to cover a greater number uh, of sites, uh, much more data. Uh, they were going to include naysayer critiques. They were going to get the real story. So as you can imagine, the, the nanny nanny naysayers were over the moon about this. In fact, one well-known naysayer, a guy named Anthony Watts, uh, he declared, and I'm quoting, I'm prepared to accept whatever result they produce, even if it proves my premise is wrong. And the group even got funding from places like a foundation sponsored by the Koch brothers. Well, they released their findings a, a few months ago, and this is really why I wanted to bring this up, because I, I just did this, and uh, um, the news about the 2011 temperatures gives me the perfect opportunity. Okay, we're going to bring a graph up. Going to bring up a graph. Uh, this graph shows uh, the trends in average global temperature. This is as determined by uh, NASA, NOAA, and uh, the joint MET-CRU research. So there's three lines on the graph. Now, because these three use somewhat different data, uh, they vary a little bit one to the next, but overall they're very close. They tell the same story. And now we're going to bring in the results of the Berkeley study. Now, the earliest temperature records date from the, uh, the, the latter part of the um, 1800s, but the Berkeley study did reconstructions using other types of data from earlier in the century, so their timeline starts at 1800. So the period to watch is from about 1880 to the present. All right, so we're going to bring up, let's bring up those results. All right, this again, first thing is this is the graph showing the three lines of the, uh, the studies. Okay, now we're going to bring in the Berkeley results. Bam. For all practical purposes, they are identical. Muller, in fact, said it came as a big surprise that the results, this I think is a very revealing statement, he said it was a big surprise that the results tracked so closely with what was already out there. He actually had to admit that his team's work confirmed that the earlier studies were done carefully and in fact that the critiques of the naysayers really didn't change the results. So how did Anthony Watts respond to these results? By calling them unscientific. He attacked the methodology and dismissed them as irrelevant. We need to realize that when we're dealing with the nanny nanny naysayers on global climate change, that's the kind of rock hard thinking that we're facing. As a footnote to all this, the governments of the world are in their own state of denial. At their most recent meeting, which was in December, to supposedly address global climate change, their big success 
was to map out a path to a future treaty on emissions reductions. In other words, their big success was that they agreed to agree sometime in the future. This treaty they're talking about, they're hoping that it will be done by uh, 2020. According to the IEA, that's three years after it will already be too late. All right, moving on to something else now. Uh, Saturday, January 21st, was the second anniversary of the hideously bad Citizens United decision. This is the, the uh, Supreme Court ruling that tore down the walls holding back unlimited amounts of untraceable corporate money from flooding into our national political process. The basis of the decision, to the extent you could say it had one, was that corporations are persons and so have free speech rights the same as actual people. We've seen the results in the multiplying numbers of super PACs uh, and in the multiplying numbers of dollars they've been able to pour into political campaigns, dollars which have already, on occasion, have already succeeded in drowning out other voices. It's a decision that if we manage to keep our republic a republic long enough, uh, I think will someday come to be seen as, along, the Dred, along with the Dred Scott decision, as one of the worst decisions the Supreme Court ever made. Now, for many people, Citizens United was their first exposure to the idea of corporate personhood. But in fact, it's been around for some time. There's a string of Supreme Court decisions over the past hundred years or so which hold that artificial persons, that is corporations, have many of the same rights as natural persons, real people. The problem is, all of those decisions drew on a single precedent, one which doesn't say what, what it seems most everyone, including most Supreme Court justices, think it said. The case was Santa Clara County uh, v. Southern Pacific Railroad. It was a tax case that the Supreme Court settled in 1886. According to what's called a header, it's a summary of the ruling usually prepared by the court reporter, and which has no legal standing, According to this header, the government held that corporations are persons under the meaning of the 14th Amendment, uh, under, the, under that amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Now, that would be the first time the court actually ruled that corporations have these kind of rights. However, nowhere in the actual decision does the court say any such thing. The issue of corporate personhood was argued during oral arguments, and not for the first time, I'll add, but the court ruled on a narrow basis, on narrow grounds, and never addressed the constitutional issue. In fact, the chief justice of the court later said that the court avoided that issue. So now how this assertion that the court found that got into that heading, is it, it's uncertain. Um, it may have been a simple misunderstanding, a simple miscommunication about what should be in the header, or it may have come from a darker place. The court reporter was a man named J.C. Bancroft Davis, and he was a former president of the Newburgh and New York Railway. Meanwhile, Supreme Court Justice Stephen Field had, as a member of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, repeatedly argued that corporations are persons done for the benefit of his patrons, the railway corporations. Well, however it got in there, the effect has been that an amendment to the Constitution, meant to protect the rights of African Americans in the wake of the Civil War, has been reinterpreted for the benefit of corporations, leading to a string of decisions, each error building on the previous error, to the point where now our entire political process is under threat. This cannot be allowed to stand. Uh, we need a constitutional amendment making it clear that artificial persons do not have the same rights as natural persons. In other words, corporations are not people. All right, after all that darkness, uh, I'm going to try to wrap up with something a little bit lighter. Uh, another edition of our occasional, occasional feature, and another thing where we just talk about some stuff that's just kind of cool and not political. Uh, in this case, paleontologists have discovered the oldest known dino, uh, dinosaur nesting site, a place where dinosaurs known as Massaspondylus uh, returned year after year to lay their eggs and birth their young. 
This site is now part of the Golden Gate Highlands National Park in South Africa. It lies about 200 miles southeast of Johannesburg. The site dates to 190 million years ago. It includes multiple dinosaur nests, eggs, hatchlings, and the remains of adults. It is the oldest evidence in the fossil record for a highly organized nest with the eggs all laid out neatly in a single layer. Now, evidence exists for single large-scale nesting among other dinosaurs like duckbills and sauropods, but that evidence dates from 90 million years ago, and this is from 190 million years ago. Massospondylus was herbivorous. It was a plant eater, had a very small head, very small neck, and could grow to be over 20 feet long. The hatchlings walked on all four legs, but the adults walked on two. Now that switch from four legs to two legs is not unknown. Think people, for example. But it does suggest that the hatchlings were basically helpless. And uh, combined with other evidence that uh, the hatchlings stayed around the nesting area until they had grown up some, suggests to paleontologists that there was some active parenting going on here. Now, researchers have found 10 dinosaur nests in the area, but they think they're actually a lot more still hidden in the cliffs. So, all right, that's going to be about it for this week. Um, one thing I've been meaning to tell people uh, that I, if you have any questions about, you know, I say something in the show and where did you get that from, uh, go to my website. Every week, I post a link to a video of the show and list all of the sources that, um, that are used. I also wanted to tell you, if you have something that you think is fit for the outrage of the week or for and another thing, um, drop me a line. I'll look at it. Absolutely. But for the moment, I just want to, as I like to have the chance from time to time to thank the folks at CCAT for their help here. I want to remind you that this is public access. This is your station. You want to do a show, you come on down here and you do it and they'll help you out. But for now, I'm going to tell you, you just have the best week you possibly can and we're out of here. We'll see you next week.